Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Sabrina King, and we're here with the Architecture Society. Uh, I'd like to invite you guys to join our YouTube channel where you can check out this lecture and any other lecture as well as interviews by our uh, club members. Um, and we would also like to invite you to join our last lecture after this one, which will be with Stephen Hall. Um, it is free, but we do encourage you to donate. And if you have any questions, you can always check out like where to donate through our Facebook and any members' emails, which we will put um, below. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce Angie Steinmuller, who is here for our lecture today. Thank you very much for joining. And without further ado, I'd like to pass it on to Mr. Moreno. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabrina. And uh, thank you, Antia, for joining us today. And I would also like to say thank you very much to uh, the Architecture Society uh, club members. I know that they've worked really hard to get the uh, interviews done, to get these lectures set up. And without their help, this would not be able to uh, happen. So with that, I'm uh, going to introduce Ms. Antia uh, Steinmuller. She is an architectural designer and educator whose research explores the agency of design and designers. At the intersection of citizen-led and city-regulated processes. Her work investigates tools for citizen engagement in the formula, formation of urban space, new forms of collective living, and the agency of architecture vis-a-vis -vis the current housing crisis. Antia is an associate professor at California College of the Arts, where she chairs the Bachelor of Architecture program and co-directs the Urban Works. Agency, uh, the Urban Works Agency Research Lab. She is also a co-founder of Ideal X, a design consultancy focused on the potentials of public spaces in transition. She holds a master's of architecture from University of California, Berkeley, where she was a John K. Branner fellow, an undergraduate degree in architecture from Ms. Antia. <laughs> Yes, it's the Technical <laughs> University of Berlin. <laughs> Fantastic. And a professional degree in interior architecture from, and again, I'm going to ask your help here. Yeah, it's um, Hochschule für Technik Stuttgart, which is another technical institution um, um, for architecture design. I, I'm, architecture. I'm glad you said that and not me. I know I would have. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And, and uh, you know, aside from all this, if you could catch uh, Antia. Uh, Antia's uh, uh, interview with Stephanie Juarez uh, on, on our YouTube channel, which I have uh, put in the chat. And uh, with that, I will pass it on to Antia. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> I'm so honored to be here and share um, the Friday night with you. So um, with this lecture tonight, I want to offer the topic of living together as something that I'm very interested in and as a territory to ponder where and how what I might call architectural actions or agency operate in order to impact how we live with one another. Living together seems critical today for a number of reasons, right? We live in an age of urban migration or migration in general, where many people with diverse backgrounds come together in cities and somehow that togetherness needs to be negotiated through architecture. We need to live together differently in the age of climate change and rethinking how we live together um, as a sort of common endeavor can make us more resilient. Living together also opens up um, questions across many scales um, about the private domestic realm, looking at homes, um, about multifamily housing, and how architecture shapes the interface between private and collective spaces. Living together also opens up how we live together in cities in a broader sense, uh, in the sense of like how we occupy public space together and make decisions together about our shared environment. And these last two points kind of hint at a sub theme that's kind of driven my work probably for the last 20 years, which is um, an interest in commoning. So how, how do we actually make decisions together, you know, as human beings, as citizens, but also as architects with citizens. So with that, um, 
uh, as you've already heard in the introduction, my, my current sort of official practice arms um, are uh, in the Urban Works Agency as one of the co-directors and um, as a co-founder and co-director of Ideal X Design. Um, so I'm an educator and as well as a sort of practitioner uh, of sorts. And um, I would probably say that I practice in four different ways. You know, as a chair of a program, uh, I shape an architecture curriculum. So the kind of larger umbrella of how we, you know, how we learn architecture, how we teach architecture. Um, as a professor myself, um, I uh, certainly um, consider teaching as a form of practice. And then um, the, the said practices that you see here. Um, so both of those are collaborative and that is something I, you know, very firmly believe in as sort of at the core of architecture. And the Urban Works Agency has four um, co-directors, Niraj Bhatia, Jeanette Kim, Chris Roach, and myself. We're sort of in the center of the left image. And uh, we are uh, always enriched by, a, sorry about the noise, um, by the uh, a changing cast of absolutely wonderful students um, who work with us on a range of projects. Um, and then uh, Ideal X is a partnership um, with a colleague of mine, Chris Folliers, and we came together around a shared interest in the public realm and in working in public and with the public. And in a way, this image of us hitting balls back and forth with foam core paddles across a temporary homemade ping pong table in a city that is not our own city. Just describes how we work together and, you know, the kind of work that we do and how we uh, keep maintain a kind of practice of exchange and critique and competition at times. So, so the Urban Works Agency, to talk about forms of practice, works mainly through research, um, exhibitions, publications, and public installations and brings work, you know, the research work that we do into speculative studios and seminars at California College of the Arts. Um, we've also partnered outside of um, the institution with government institutions and uh, nonprofit organizations and other educational uh, spaces. Ideal X also does research and publications, but also works with private clients as well as nonprofits. Um, our work aims to reach a public audience wherever possible and to also take place in public space wherever possible. Um, one of the things we design is tools for activating public space and tools for engaging with non-expert audiences in conversations about design. So with all of that said, long introduction, um, I would like to show you six projects tonight. Um, and I would probably describe them more as six strands of work, you know, that sort of take on different sub projects. Um, and all of them sort of open up a spectrum about how uh, we as architects have agency in shaping how people live together and really also sort of uh, different forms of practice. Um, the work spreads across three scales um, on the left, you know, sort of the scale of the single family home, um, how we live together in that. Um, collective forms of living in urban settings. So as we come together more densely, how do we negotiate that proximity? And then, as I said earlier, um, generally, like how we come together in cities, period, um, how we as architects shape urban life. Um, and then with that, it touches on three types of work or three types of practice, a practice of more traditional built work um, on the left, um, on research as practice. And then lastly, um, on a form of practice that is one of designing catalysts or designing tools of engagement. So really not designing final results, but designing actually the way of doing things. So I'll, I'll launch right into the first one. And um, I've tried to sort of head up each chapter with just sort of the, the kind of lineage or legacy of work that, um, you know, I, I always consider uh, with, with any project that I work on. And so um, if, as we think about um, single family homes, I think it almost can't be done uh, without thinking about the somewhat problematic history of the American suburb. Um, which, you know, really sort of took off probably post-World War II 
and uh, really is fraught with a lot of issues of racism, um, specifically uh, the inability of uh, a lot of people of color to access uh, financial uh, programs Programs, financial government programs that were otherwise supporting, you know, all the white folks, you know, to afford their own home. And then um, it also should be noted that um, the single family sort of support from governments uh, really was a way of separating people from uh, sort of the culture of the workplace, their fellow workers, if not the unions in an effort to prevent uh, any kind of uh, discontent, any, any kind of impending worker strike about how the workplace was unfolding and instead um, focusing them uh, through financial responsibility and through the physical space of the dispersed you know single family home in the suburb um, really putting focus on the family unit right over the kind of unit of colleagues in the workplace um, so not to sort of uh, ever neglect um, that kind of history of uh, politics um, that is behind the suburbs and the single family home. Um, domestic space also comes with a sort of measurement and a kind of scale of rooms. You know, we talk about three bedroom, two bathroom houses, etc. And then often equally comes with um, notions of a sort of gendered separation of these rooms. You know, we think of the kitchen, you know, you see this in the image of the right, the kitchen as the traditionally female space, you know, perhaps there's a sewing room and a man cave and, you know, a workshop, etc. in the basement. And this kind of separation in room, rooms, into rooms and, and dedicated preformed program uh, is also a kind of notion that I think we always have to question as we design in that realm. So with that, um, I'll launch into some build work um, that I did in the last uh, probably five, six years. Um, I didn't mention, I think before, uh, before I started and focused on Ideal X design, I was a principal at Studio Urbis, um, a firm that does more traditional architectural work um, and specifically does a lot of residential um, projects. So the two built projects that I'm, I'm showing here, I was the designer and project architect and project manager for while I was a principal at that firm. So, um, this particular house is located in Palo Alto, California, and you can see in the image of the on the left that it is your sort of typical suburban lot, right, where um, you have the sort of very clearly defined set of houses with a driveway and often a separate garage. And in that neighborhood, certainly specifically, the, the space around the house is really uh, very much um, uh, sort of leftover space, right? There are side yards that aren't used for anything. The backyards aren't always used. And it is sort of the house as object. And uh, this project, which we call the Elements House, um, is uh, an attempt to really actually question all these boundaries, both internally between the different uh, dedicated domestic spaces that are traditionally separated, and then externally between the house and the yard uh, in a Sort of typical suburban uh, prototypes. So what you see on the right is a kind of conceptual drawing of that house where um, at the ground level you basically see that there's no sort of cleanly defined room except perhaps, can you guys see my cursor? Yes? No? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Perfect. So um, except for, you know, the half bath and, you know, a pantry, etc. There isn't really uh, any sort of clean separation. And then the, the boundaries between the house and the yard are also beginning to be dissolved. And uh, instead, um, many of the architectural elements that are part of the building envelope or the elements on the inside begin to spread between spaces and to sort of set up ambiguity that then can be programmed in a lot of different and various and spontaneous ways. And this is for a family with two young children at the time. So there was a lot of sort of concern about um, creating different spaces of play and uh, different spaces that just sort of tied in with the elements of the, the lot, um, which included of course, green space, but also water. 
So here you sort of see how we've used architectural devices to achieve that. You know, so rather than having, say, a gabled sort of centralized form, um, there's a lot of elements that extend sort of outwards um, you know, from shading devices to sort of canopies over parking areas to sort of screens. So there's always multiple layers. Um, so it's not entirely clear where exactly the house begins and the yard ends, et cetera. Um, you can also see this in uh, the two sections here that cut through two different areas um, of the house, sort of parallel to the image that you just saw, where you see in a way multiple layers of vertical boundaries um, and multiple sort of suggestions of, you know, drops in floor plates or drops in ceiling plates um, that may Make it less clear as to where uh, an individual space really ends. And you can also see on the right hand side here that um, sometimes it sort of appears as if the, the property wall is really actually the boundary of the house. And that particular space, you know, space four in this diagram is what you see on the next slide, if it advances, yes. So the sort of notion here, right, that you have a dining space, you know, but that dining space doesn't have really defined walls. It has a lot of different kinds of boundary in ceiling um, towards the outside. There's a water feature on the outside. There's a giant glass sliding door that, you know, goes away and includes basically um, what is otherwise a, um, a patio space into the space of the dining room, the concrete floor continues in. And then we also worked a lot with color as a way of sort of transporting, you know, elements from the outside to the interior of the space. So you see this here in the foreground in, with the green, and then you'll see in a moment what the blue is doing in the back. So here's a few more uh, floor plans you know the center one is really the ground floor the house has a basement um, which you see on the left and an upper floor that is perhaps more traditional with bedrooms and and bathrooms um, and on the ground floor again you sort of see this relatively open floor plan where um, sort of shifts in all directions you know of the the wall elements blur the boundaries between these traditionally defined sort of gender domestic spaces. You know, even the dining table uh, is actually also a kitchen island and that kitchen island bridges and slides between what is a kitchen space and what is uh, more of a family room. So everything sort of uh, was, was meant to kind of question these domestic boundaries to create a kind of living landscape that um, is more social in nature and um, leads to a kind of more collective family life. So one of the sort of star moments of this project is uh, in the back of the house where you saw the blue earlier in the photos. So this house, the client came to us with this notion that a pool was really incredibly important to the family. And uh, he had that sense that the pool should not be separate from the house. So um, this led to the design of, uh, in essence, the house is, is built um, from a construction viewpoint as a kind of ship in the ground that has a continuous concrete foundation that includes both the pool and the basement space, which is a media viewing room and an exercise room and things like that. Um, and uh, has between the pool and uh, these sort of lower living spaces, um, like 13 and 14, a giant aquarium window, which is a three inch, uh, sorry, three inch, yeah, I think three inch piece of acrylic. And um, this is sort of what the pool looks like when you see the house from the back. And then when you look from the house down towards the lower level and towards the pool, and these are shots from these lower living sp uh, spaces of the house um, where you basically see the people sort of swimming and, you know, you can hang out at a bench, you know, right by that aquarium window. So clearly this is not a cheap house. It is absolutely not for um, an underprivileged um, group of people, but um, it, it exemplifies an approach to domestic architecture that tries to break with these sort of trad unquestioned traditions of the house as defined object and also um, the room as a sort of predefined notion. Um, so one, one more set of images for this, um, this is that kitchen that I mentioned and that dining table that's sort of slipping out and 
everywhere there is sort of an attempt to stay connected to the light outside, to the view to the outside. And you see the green peering again at that end of the house in direct context with the green outside in the front yard and the street beyond. So um, the second uh, build project that I'm showing you is not ground up construction. It's a major uh, renovation to a suburban house. Um, and I'm talking about this project because it questions a different kind of boundary or, or you know, re-questions one that I just talked about, which is really sort of that boundary between inside and outside, between, you know, the domestic privacy and the neighbors. And uh, this project was sort of transforming what is really a very traditional um, suburban home of that neighborhood. So on the left here, you sort of see what it was and you see it, you know, exactly as I sort of described earlier, chopped up into a lot of different rooms and spaces, um, very sort of contained and, and segmented. And on the right, you sort of see with the surrounding green space kind of what we did to it where um, on the sort of left portion of it, we ended up um, leaving the bedrooms, you know, more or less uh, the same. But then in the center of the house, in essence, removed everything <laughs> and uh, really opened everything up. And then specifically um, tried to really um, dissolve the boundary between um, the interior and the exterior. You know, this is also a climate that is just wonderful to live outside. You know, it's basically sunny all the time. Uh, very little rain. And um, so in essence, the central part of the house becomes the sort of transition between a designed front yard and a designed backyard and uh, very much sort of feels like a continuum. We drew it this way, you know, um, also just to sort of show this in section, you know, where um, both interior um, and again, sort of the use of color is sort of part of this here, as you'll see in a moment, but basically taking out the, the main back wall of the house and um, really sort of designing everything as a continuum. So here is basically what that looks like. It's one giant, you know, six panel sliding door. And then you see that on the interior, there's basically very little wall left, if any. And uh, everything becomes kind of uh, the same sort of open space with uh, a similar sort of flooring material that continues from the inside out. And you see again the use of green um, uh, in the background with the green of the, the uh, property wall plantings, etc., helping to make that continuity and connection. Um, we did something to the yard, you know, that sort of picked up on associations that we all might have with kind of larger, if not agricultural landscapes. You know, this is an image from the Netherlands, happens to be from the Netherlands, um, from the way they sort of cultivate uh, different flowers um, in, in kind of large scale form. And so at the end of, of this property, we basically used the existing backyard fence uh, to become what we understood to be really the, the kind of wall of the house, right, rather than being the wall of the garden. And so together with a uh, water feature on the right, um, this really becomes um, kind of together with the, the blue wall on the inside, this becomes really what contains the interior living space. And, um, you know, here's sort of a shot of the uh, water feature on, on the side of the yard. And then we brought that same sort of understanding of selective color bands um, to the interior space um, with the open kitchen and a kind of small divider wall um, between entry and kitchen. And so you see that sort of pattern of, you know, plantings and flowers and colors, et cetera, selectively coming into um, different moments in the house. And we also interfered with the roof and kind of, again, used um, the ceiling plane as a way of dividing space um, or suggesting um, different spaces within one larger living space. So with that, I'm going to leave the domestic, uh, private domestic realm and direct us towards um, living together more collectively. And again, I just want to give that um, a quick sort of historical context, acknowledging that really the single family sort of pattern that we just talked about is a relatively new thing. Right. If we go further back in history, we really mostly see uh, um, ways in which people live together in larger family constellations, in utopian social uh, experiments. 
and it, that it is really um, a relatively new phenomenon of the last century um, that we live together just as a nuclear family. And, you know, it's definitely one of my uh, goals, you know, the goals of my practice and my interests um, to question that and to sort of see like whether living more collectively doesn't um, help us become more resilient in the face of economic inequality and or climate change. So um, what you see here is on the left, um, one of the uh, social utopian uh, utopian socialist experiments um, that emerged around the time the US was settled. Um, this, is, this happens to be uh, a photo of the family stair in France, uh, but the, the drawn image down below is the fellow stair by Fourier, um, who believed in basically having, um, I think, um, over a thousand people living together in one house and inhabiting these very large um, dining spaces and uh, living actually completely outside of uh, a pattern of nuclear families. Each person in his vision um, uh, basically uh, migrated between three different bedrooms. You see all of these opening up towards the, the big collective dining space. And every person was actually meant to be in three relationships, married with two children, and then um, raising one child with another person, and then lastly, having any number of affairs without children. So um, again, totally different model of uh, living together, of family, notions of family. And then on the right, of course, um, there's many non-utopian examples. Um, this is just one of many, several hundred years old, uh, the Tulu typology in China, which is a traditional typology in which um, large family uh, complexes or large uh, extended families live together uh, basically at, in a vertical slice of each of these circles with the bedrooms being up above and the social spaces in the kitchen down below. And there's no private circulation in most of these, meaning that as soon as you leave your bedroom, you're already out in the realm of the bigger family space. So there's an incredibly rich tradition, right, that we can look back to as we confront, you know, the various problems that we might have today. So for me, um, all of this, the interest sort of emerged around seeing San Francisco's housing crisis, because that is sort of where I teach and work and live. And uh, um, San Francisco looks like this on the left. Um, for those of you who haven't been, it's really quite low density and also zoned mostly for single family residential. So everything there that's gray and light blue is a uh, single family. Um, so not at all sort of uh, able to um, really host like great examples of living collectively and tearing down housing is politically very unacceptable. My own theory is that that comes from um, the fact that San Francisco is so hilly, meaning everyone um, who is in the city, lives in the city, etc., constantly looks at it. Like as you're moving through the city, you're constantly having views of the city. And there's very much an image of what San Francisco looks like, namely exactly what you see to the left, that makes it so unacceptable, you know, to think about like, well, it could be six stories tall all over, right, and host a much greater uh, or a much different sort of housing typology. And so this is also housing stock that was built for the nuclear family. And today, I think the nuclear family makes up about 30% of San Francisco's population. San Francisco has gained a tremendous amount of uh, new residents with the, the tech industry growing in Silicon Valley. So what that has meant is basically that housing prices have exploded. This data is now a little bit older and the pandemic has uh, thrown a completely you know, unpredictable factor into this. But basically for years, San Francisco was either the most expensive for a second expensive place to live in, in the United States with the median price for a one bedroom unit anywhere sort of around $3,700, right? And for that, you don't get a lot, right? This is not a generous <laughs> place to live. Um, so to um, look at this sort of um, very complex set of supply and demand in a world where you can't tear down any housing has led to a trend of architecture 
architectural responses that are basically uh, going into the direction of micro units. So there are areas of San Francisco that are zoned for higher density, and they have basically hosted, you know, now become the host of um, mid-rise buildings, perhaps, or six-story buildings, um, where uh, everything consists of micro units. By definition, that's um, a private domestic environment, a private domestic unit um, that is can be as little as 275 square feet. So very, very small. And uh, basically the attempt here, you know, conceptually is to squeeze all the components of what would normally be, you know, a studio or one bedroom into a tiny, tiny footprint advertising it as like, oh, you get everything, you know, you get your big kitchen and et cetera. But the reality really is that it relies on convertible furniture in order to work. So basically it means being able to fry an egg while sitting at the edge of your bed or, you know, dealing with the underside of your bed, you know, that is in fact your desk or dining table. So having to sort of uh, over the course of the day, multiple times, um, clear your table if you want to take a nap, etc. So in the end, um, I would sort of say, while people still pay a lot, they actually get less, less space, less flexibility, and certainly less community. Um, this kind of way of living, of course, does have some tradition in San Francisco. Um, when the city was growing in the mid-19, in the mid-1800s, um, the uh, like the the uh, many sort of people who arrived in San Francisco for work and uh, were uh, coming alone sparked a typology called single room occupancy hotels, um, which you see here. And so uh, many many of the kind of producers of micro units kind of re reference this as you know a kind of traditional um, typology. Uh, in parallel, something else emerged, um, which is uh, what I would call intentional communities. Um, so these are bottom up ways in which people come together uh, with friends, um, with like minded people um, in chosen families and uh, basically occupy uh, spaces that were designed for nuclear families um, as a group of, you know, 10, 15, 20 people. And uh, we noticed this first, I think, in 2014 or so, when the media was basically sort of saying like, oh, this is just because people want to save money. This is just an economic strategy. And we uh, actually felt that it was really important to look at that more closely because it seemed like these uh, co-living scenarios or these intentional communities are surviving and they're doing really well. So they must be doing something right that we as architects can learn from. So they, of course, also have a tradition in San Francisco, which goes back to the 1960s and 70s to the Summer of Love, where the Bay Area and its hinterland saw hundreds of communes um, that came about through a rejection of commercialism and an ideology of shared property and labor that resulted in a lot of experiments with alternative family structures. Um, the difference perhaps is that at the time these communes rejected the city as part of the establishment that they were critical of and uh, became and, and instead sort of went uh, outside of the city and became part of you know what's commonly understood as the back to the land movement. A few of them remained in the city and you'll see a little bit later um, how we're, how we've sort of looked at them and how they compare to what's happening today. Today, of course, because uh, we have this entrepreneurial spirit uh, from Silicon Valley and you know the Bay Area in general and a lot of venture capital in the city, um, we see um, what I would call co-living, you know, in, in contrast to the intentional communities. And these are basically startups that provide um, versions of these micro units, and some of them are really um, what we might call managed communes, right? Where it's not really a micro unit, it's individual bedrooms and shared kitchens, et cetera. But the difference here is that those are managed by a company. There's often a community manager or a relationship manager living on site um, who tries to basically iron out any issues about how the group lives together or who does the dishes or, you know, does the dishes for everybody. Um, so um, with, with that, um, uh, I want to launch into um, a project that we call Commoning Domestic Space, an Atlas of Co-Living Experiments. Um, this is work that I've been doing with my colleague Niraj Bhatia in the Urban Works Agency. And uh, we 
basically started um, formulating ways of documenting um, bottom-up intentional communities, these kinds of chosen families that I mentioned, um, and trying to study really how they occupy the existing hardware of the city, the buildings that were really designed for completely different purposes and family groups. So we, we started again with the premise that um, if space is indeed a social product, as Lefebvre and others would have argued, we as architects have something to learn from the way successful co-living experiments are structured and need to look at them uh, closely in order to better understand the parameters that contribute to their success. So we hope that through this, we can highlight and define the agency that architecture and architects might have in really developing and arguing for very different contemporary housing typologies. So here you see, um, in essence, the first sort of 10 um, uh, communities that we looked at. We are currently, I think, on number 38 or something, but we basically began by uh, mapping out um, where these co-living experiments are in the Bay Area and also in all across California, as you see on the right. And uh, we, we learned, and we, we still have not found proof of this, but we basically learned that um, uh, the, the amount of, of communities in the Bay Area today that work this way, that are commune-like, um, is the same number that we had in the 1960s and 70s. And they're not very visible, and we think that they deserve to be. So um, we developed a particular lens to look at this. Um, so this is sort of part of explaining um, the, the research of this. Um, we are basically looking at three different things. We call them um, three different lenses of hardware, software, and orgware. Hardware, hardware describes the spatial typologies, really the kind of classic things that we look at as architecture. Software describes the social structure, how space is used, and specifically how it's shared. Um, and then workware um, describes the less tangible things, like what kind of rules and um, sort of social agreements um, are necessary in order for 20 people to figure out who does the dishes and so on. So um, one of the things that we noticed, of course, is um, that most of these things happen in, uh, again, like different typologies of housing that are not at all meant for uh, 20 unrelated people. So let me go into um, the project that you see here on the right. It's called the Embassy Commune. And you sort of get a sense of the opulence of uh, this mansion, you know, which used to be designed for one probably very wealthy family way back when. And so the, the way we draw these hardware drawings is uh, by basically exploding an axonometric and uh, using a blue coding on the walls for all the spaces that end up shared. And then there's a gray coding on the wall, which you see here, for example, um, which is what is left sort of as a private space, a space for an individual or a couple, et cetera. And so um, we do this consistently and comparatively um, in order to sort of read like what's common and what's not at all common um, in these projects. So perhaps just quickly, you know, you see here that there is a ground level that's mostly um, collective. Uh, sorry, this is a, a basement level that has a bowling alley and um, what now I believe is a yoga space. Um, and a shared garage, and then at ground level, almost everything is shared from different living spaces, dining spaces, um, the antisocial social space um, in the corner here, and then an upper level in which uh, you see most of the bedrooms. Um, the second thing we do is we look at this quantitatively, um, and uh, in essence, we sort of look at each of the lots, how much is built and unbuilt, um, how the program is distributed between privacy, really the bedroom and bathroom, and then um, what we call communal luxuries. So all the different shared spaces that, for example, in a micro unit, you would not have, right? And you would also not have if you have a regular one bedroom. So in the embassy, that includes, you know, of course, more than one kitchen, a dining space, several living rooms, various nooks, a library, an office, a bowling alley, a porch, a garden, a lot of storage, and a garage. So um, pointing out and basically folding open, you know, for all to see like what the benefits really are once we're willing to share our living space with others. 
And then here on the right, you see one of the spaces that emerged in the 60s, um, a small commune of uh, feminist activists that occupied um, uh, a traditional sort of one family house. Okay, here's what that looks like once you start comparing like a lot more of these. These are not all, <laughs> and I will not bore you by going through every single one, but hopefully this gives you an impression of like how many different manifestations of uh, these intentional communes there are. And I will go through just a couple of different ones to, to talk about the range. So the Red Vic commune um, is situated in inside a former bed and breakfast. So that, of course, makes complete sense. There's a lot of bedrooms. Um, and then the ground floor um, is sort of your typical hotel ground floor, very open, you know, lots of different facilities and clearly ideal for a lot of people to share space. This is a slightly older way of drawing, you know, where we worked with hatches instead of colors. So just keep that in mind. And then this allowed us to sort of look at, you know, some of these amazing spaces uses. This is a five foot tall space that sits above, you know, the area where the garbage cans are moved in and out and has become a kind of library and private reading space, you know, that people can claim as a retreat from the group. The Bus Patch Commune is a nomadic commune that's moved between different Bay Area locations. And here, uh, basically, old muni buses, um, like street buses, um, have been divided. You can sort of see this on the left divided into two bedrooms each. And then a tent on the outside is really the kitchen and gathering space. On the site is also people living in boats and people living in other, you know, van type situations. And everyone in essence sort of shares the outdoor space um, together with solar panels and, you know, shared kind of uh, water supply. So here's a photo of what the kitchen looks like in a scenario like that. And then um, another strange example is a former convent that's in San Francisco that also, of course, has a lot of different bedrooms, but then has things like chapel spaces, right, that become, uh, you know, suddenly a new form of collective space and living space. And then this is also an artist commune. So the basement there becomes a maker space, like one big sort of open space that you see at the bottom right. And then everyone sort of uses what used to be the chapel space in the back um, as a music room, as a space for parties, for, you know, lectures they organize, dance parties, and so on. So um, one of the things that we're learning, right, sort of come a little bit about the conclusions here is, um, you know, do we see a trend with the different building types, you know, and so one of the things we noticed is that um, uh, warehouse types, right, sort of former paint factories and other kinds of warehouses are super popular with kind of artist communes. And that's easy to understand in that this is an open space, right, for the most part, where you end up subdividing and making a little bit of privacy where needed. Um, so on the left, you see a former paint factory um, with the, the space becoming the main sort of uh, warehouse space becoming a multi-functioning space. And then a lot of not very legal bedrooms kind of split off uh, from the side and a really cool roof garden that emerged. Um, and then um, I won't go into every single one. Um, a lot of former hotels, right? I just described the Red Victorian, which you see on the left, you know, with the sort of separate floors of many kind of Victorian articulated bedrooms and this fantastic sort of ground floor that has a little basement space. Um, that every single time I went to this place had been completely different and completely revisited and redesigned. So it makes sense in a way that um, uh, both intentional communities and um, also co-living startups gravitate to these typologies because of the number of bedrooms that they have. On the right here, you see San Francisco's version of Rome. Rome is a global uh, co-living uh, startup and they took over a former bed and breakfast, um, you know, again, for that sort of reason that there is a lot of already defined private space and a collective space on the ground level. Um, the single room occupancy hotels that I mentioned uh, earlier in the history of San Francisco, there's still a lot of them here and they tend to not be popular with um, intentional communities. And this is probably because um, the private spaces that, you know, you see them sort of packed in uh, at, at this tribe 
uh, location here, you know, this is 70 people living on two floors with seven bathrooms shared. So these are not as conducive really to producing community. You know, there often is a fairly restricted uh, collective space. There's very little collective space on the floor levels. Um, and so in the end, it's great for startups and developers who just wanna squeeze in a lot of people with less care for um, how they relate to one another and how the architecture sort of helps with smaller nooks and you know, different spaces interspersed with bedrooms. Um, that allow people to just informally gather in a variety of social configurations. And then last but not least, um, San Francisco does have a lot of mansions. And uh, as you saw the embassy commune, you know, which again sort of uh, allows us to look at the, the wealth of things, you know, that uh, 20 people get to share, you know, when they occupy a space like that together. And on the right is a startup uh, version of that. Um, this is from the company Podshare that is in LA and San Francisco. And um, they basically just made one bedroom at the top with uh, bunk beds for 14 people in one room. And uh, so everything basically, including the private space there, has become sort of shared, you know, stuffing again a lot of people into the same uh, room, into the same facilities. So, and then we can sort of track back um, what are sort of architectural components like local devices that seem to work really well. And I mentioned these kind of strange spaces, you know, that we don't really quite know how to use and that suddenly have a use for withdrawing from the community. Um, we found that um, any room that had sort of bay windows or nooks of any kind, um, were really fantastic and well used in the sense that people liked being in the nook and sort of being alone in public, right? And being like doing their own thing, like at the edge of uh, a kind of social gathering. And then, you know, not surprisingly, um, ways in which uh, architecture can offer flexible interfaces where spaces can become different things over time um, are, are also something that we saw again and again. So the software drawings um, were sort of an exploded axonometric type that um, uh, we invented to show like how many people share what. So you see earlier versions of this here, you know, from the bus patch um, uh, nomadic commune where one individual has their bed and their little sort of half of a bus. Two people are bus mates, you know, and then everybody else is sort of a neighbor on the site. Whereas uh, the middle one is from uh, the Red Victorian that you saw, where an individual might actually just have a bed, right? And share, like have four roommates literally in the same room and then um, share a, a shower with nine people and then the ground floor with 23. So these kind of different hierarchies of what we call nested uh, scales of sharing are the things we're basically seeing through these drawings. Here is the sort of later colored version of, of these. And oftentimes they also sort of uh, just allow us to see just how many things there really are shared. Again, coming back to the notion of communal luxuries um, uh, in, in these projects. And then another kind of drawing allowed us to look at how um, the architecture really acts just as a framework and how people use their own strategies and their own belongings to claim space. So here you see in this kind of watery blue um, uh, what people sort of added to space and how they've claimed space. Um, and then the black sort of in the background is really the framework of the, the architecture. And you see this in a room and at the embassy that has two bunk beds on the left and sort of in the main view. And then here's a bus interior of one of those divided Muni buses at the bus patch. So you see the the old bus seats, right, <laughs> and um, the handles, etc., in in blue and sorry, in in black, and then everything that people have sort of brought in, you know, from the AC to you know various ways of storing and the bed in the background in blue. And with those drawings, we're also looking at sort of the phenomena of the spaces that are collective in here. 
So uh, in that, on the left hand, you see um, one of the social spaces in the Red Victorian, where we really sort of see that this weird sort of floor plan, right, that this space has, has a million sort of jogs and nooks and angles. But what that does is that it allows for about six or seven different things to happen all at once. So you have someone, you know, sitting in a sauna at one end of the space, a sewing machine in the middle, and then sort of a social corner in the back with a guest bed up above and a kind of whiteboard for a business meeting and, you know, a disco ball, et cetera. So these spaces really function that way. Like we went to visit many, many times and we're just amazed by, you know, again, like sort of reflecting on how the architecture encourages something like that and sort of came to the conclusion that it is really that sort of totally convoluted, um, bizarre sort of ge geometry of the floor plan. And then on the right, we did a version of the drawings um, in this former paint factory um, with the Langton Labs commune. And here we sort of divided a view of the overall uh, collective space into four different panels because we noticed that uh, d depending on the time of year, um, very different things would happen in that space. This is a Burning Man community, you know, that festival in the desert. So once a year, this becomes a sort of factory of Burning Man production. And then there's a lot of storage right after. And once that's sort of been cleaned up, it becomes a party space and is otherwise a le leisure space. So in time, you know, these spaces also uh, really hold uh, a million different uses. So here's, you know, for your entertainment, just like the, the huge variety of, of study of softwares, you know, as, as we've uh, sort of looked at them. And then, um, you know, just a kind of learning experience here of all the many sort of forms of uh, privacy, right, that we see from um, what is kind of these uh, serial um, two-story uh, beds, you know, bunk beds at pod share. Um, to a huge variety of different kinds of spaces at embassy, right, for bunk beds, for couples, for singles, um, etc. So it allows us to see like the variety of privacy that is offered for very different kinds of people and needs. Um, we also sort of saw like very different forms of communal space. Um, so this shows, you know, again, like ve very different forms of housing here, the Davis domes on the right that have a kind of uh, greenhouse structure as one of the social spaces and the many, many spaces of uh, collective um, uh, facilities in one of the warehouse based um, communes. Um, I'm probably going to go a little bit faster here because you get you get sort of the sense right of um, what is going on. Um, so um, here are just a few sort of learning outcomes from uh, the, the software um, space. So here you see these kind of articulated bunk beds and we sort of see that in general, um, in, in this way of sort of configuring sharing spaces, um, that there is a kind of hyper articulation and a sort of hyper design of private space. So there you see these kind of serially fabricated um, beds with a guardrail, um, you know, some place to hang things, a built in television, various shelves, um, and so on. Um, or um, this kind of opposite where private space becomes depersonalized through the fact that it, it already has everything. So when people move in and out, they basically bring nothing. And that in itself is sort of a weird thing about, you know, like what happens to the private space as a representation of individuals. And then um, we also sort of see in the intentional communities a detachment from private space. So so here, you know, even though this looks so highly personalized, um, what's happening really is that people actually change bedrooms all the time and don't necessarily feel like, you know, the space is theirs and they're going to be there forever. Okay, I'm going to get to the last um, chapter of um, this commoning domestic space, um, uh, looking at sort of orgware. Right, so here are sort of two um, relatively funny um, uh, shots that we saw in, in the different um, communes. So when we live together, right, it's not easy. We all have our very own 
kind of ways in which we want domestic space to be from the way the toilet paper is mounted <laughs> on the left, you know, to sort of ownership over um, fridge and food and, you know, not wanting others to eat, um, to eat our food. Um, so it requires labels and it requires rules. Um, and so here is sort of our perhaps more esoteric diagram of, you know, like how this works in the intentional communities. So what you see here, um, hopefully quickly, is concentric rings that um, are basically divided into these tick marks along the perimeter and each tick mark is one hour of domestic labor per month. So you see the total hour of domestic labor needed in this particular intentional communities, community in each month. And then the rings are daily tasks, weekly tasks, monthly tasks and quarterly tasks. And then um, this basically um, through the different hatch patterns um, shows a system in which the community has stewards for different areas of domestic life. So they have, you know, they rent short-term rooms, so there's someone responsible for everything related to guest rooms. There's someone responsible for all the domestic labor, like doing dishes, cooking, you know, cleaning, etc., and for finances and for, you know, events and so on. So every, you see sort of names assigned to each hatch pattern. So there's stewards that basically then divide the labor to different people in the community and, you know, you see their names kind of associated um, with like around the, the exterior of the ring. And so this shows you, amongst other things, just how complex it is, you know, to navigate this and what you outsource and what you don't outsource. And then, of course, there's very different configurations of like how that works, um, depending on how the ownership works, depending on whether it is an intentional community that discusses a lot and spends a lot of time in community meetings, or it is literally a startup, which you see on the right, you know, which is actually much, much simpler in, in the sense that a community manager does everything. Okay, so there's a few more things we're interested in that I'll just flip through. Um, we, uh, you know, looking at sort of these individual projects, you know, doesn't give the full picture. And, you know, we, we of course, wish as urbanists that um, this is something that can really have an impact on urban uh, realm um, through the fact, through the way in which um, these communities network with one another. And we do actually really see that um, through um, the different uh, examples that we study and we sometimes see it as uh, basically just communities that are near one another um, that will sort of have common events and sort of share their spaces with one another and share their keys with one another or like literally the same commune spread over multiple buildings in the same street. Um, there also are formal networks. Um, this is one called the Hate Street Commons. Um, the number changes every time. I believe by now it's more than nine, um, but they are roughly in the same neighborhood of San Francisco um, and share a lot of things like um, yoga spaces, like uh, vans, bigger tools, um, boats, things that you don't need all the time and that you certainly actually don't need to own. And so, you know, this becomes this kind of informal network of sharing goods. And then um, other themes are this kind of comparison that I mentioned before, like what does a commune look like when it's in, in the hinterland, you know, versus when it is in the city? Um, what are sort of designed experiments where architects have already sort of tried to um, take lessons from that? So we've expanded our range from California to a lot of uh, Asian and European um, case studies. And then in these case studies, we ended up sort of finding that there's a lot of co-financing models where people already sort of come together prior to designing and prior to developing the projects and pool their financial resources, bypass the private developers and have huge savings by basically designing as a group and developing as a group. So this is one example in Berlin um, that does that. And then we also bring this into our pedagogy. Um, I know there's at least one person on the call who's taken, who's taken one of these studios um, with us. Um, so, uh, you know, our housing studios are not conventional housing studios, but are almost always um, studios that ask students to design for collective life. You know, the one here was around startup kitchens. 
and the one here is around homeschooling. Um, using a kind of banded typology, you know, and sort of interruptions in that typology to create little spaces of learning between different units. And um, eventually this work that we did with students, you know, together with our own research um, became uh, sort of publicly or um, we found ways of basically uh, educating a broader public, which is really uh, sort of part of the motivation here. So the research is not just because we're interested in it, but rather because um, there's so much to learn here. And we really hope that this can change the way people perceive um, when they when they hear the word commune, they often have negative associations. Um, and so one of the things that we were lucky to do is exhibit this work at the Seoul Biennale of Architecture and Urbanism in 2017. And we created this sort of abstract city and embedded some of the models of the student projects and then used augmented reality, as you see on the left here and on the right, um, to basically project collective use into these um, uh, new house typologies. And then we brought that back, that work back to the Bay Area um, and exhibited in a local museum, the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. And uh, there the work got paired with um, other work by the Urban Works Agency um, on resilience and climate change. Um, and we thought what everything sort of had in common was the notion that the table is the site of decision making, whether it's in the family, you know, you sit around the dining table having conversations and making family discussions. Uh, decisions and you know otherwise it's the political table right of representative bodies that um, make decisions about environmental policies so we picked um, all kinds of famous tables you can see in the diagram on the right the UN Security Council table or the White House uh, President's desk or um, the Paris Peace Accord desk etc and we reproduce them at scale and you see our co-living work on these two right tables where you know we presented them as these kind of it was actually a triptych not a diptych um, but basically presented these different ways of looking at it and then added these giant magnifying glasses that were several inches in diameter so people could kind of glimpse into um, these various uh, domestic kind of lives um, and then for those of you who get to travel this summer I don't know if anyone does we are presenting the work at the uh, Venice Biennale of Architecture in 2021. So it was supposed to happen last year. It's the never ending project that uh, didn't get to um, be presented last year because of the pandemic. But here um, we basically uh, you know, show both design work, which is not by me, um, it's by Niraj Bhatia's firm, um, my research partner. Um, and then half of the installation is basically the research. And this was sort of what was originally planned, which is that um, you know, sort of printed on the canvas, um, these different case studies kind of hang from what is in fact an IKEA um, laundry stand. So these are IKEA drying racks that anyone can buy for, you know, $20 or so. And they form the substructure of um, this uh, sort of outline of models and research, you know, mo most of which has now become um, screens, you know, because no one can touch anything and there's big Corona related um, regulations that have had us change this a million different times. Um, I should also say, like, when we talk about sort of impact and reaching the public, aside from these exhibitions, which still happen sort of in exclusive um, venues, um, we are also actively working with the San Francisco Planning Department. Um, we got a grant from them uh, to basically help them rewrite their planning code to write code that's specific to collective living. Um, and, and hopefully we will uh, in the future uh, have impact on some of the areas where new housing gets built, like in central Soma in uh, San Francisco. So that's kind of ongoing and in the works. So super, super quickly, a slightly older project um, that um, looked at collective living in a different way, in the sense of sharing land, you know, sharing your own sort of property. Um, and in a way it ties this back to the single family home that, that we talked about as a topic earlier. And again, this is so important for San Francisco um, as a sort of conceptual leap because there's so little of the city that is zoned for higher density. So the city a few years ago came out with uh, a legislation for accessory dwelling units. 
um, and uh, recommended sort of different typologies um, of, you know, the typical Victorian house, etc., and how they could be augmented with a an extra unit um, that would allow someone else to live on the same property and, you know, would create a rental income for those uh, living in the main house. And, you know, these are excerpts from uh, the San Francisco Planning Department's uh, own literature. So you can sort of see like how they sold this kind of to the public, um, describing it very well, what you can and what you cannot do, how to convert your garage into an, an accessory dwelling. And um, they felt that um, it was uh, very dif difficult to sort of change people's minds about um, that it's okay to have an ADU, it's okay to live with higher density, to let other people live on your property. And so they approached um, CCA and the Urban Works Agency, and we ran a seminar um, that was called, it was actually in, initially called Interior Urbanism, but later Urbanism from Within, and sort of looked at exactly all the many parcels on the right in black um, that are zoned for single family residents and that the, the ADU legislation applies to. And then did a study basically of much more inventive ways of uh, creating accessory dwelling units. So here's a few drawings um, that you sort of see um, choosing an axonometric as a way to make, make drawings accessible and legible to um, lay people and then just making them sort of fun to look at um, through these section perspectives. And then um, here the way again to get this to the public was a sort of semi-interactive exhibition at um, Spur Urban Center is um, a kind of a nonprofit uh, exhibition venue um, that gets a very diverse uh, audience both sort of lay people, um, but also people from the industry, developers, etc. So it's not like a museum and it's a really good place to get a broad segment of the population to look at something. So um, in this exhibition, basically on the wall to the right, you see like all these drawings that I just showed um, printed on newsprint and on the racks right below that, people could just sort of like grab um, a leaflet, a pamphlet and take it home and sort of, you know, sort of see, is that the typology of their house and what might they be doing with it? And then in these sort of curtains that seemed like, okay, privacy, you know, here's privacy happening. Um, there's little peepholes and inside the peepholes, you could sort of look into scale models of these new um, accessory dwelling types as a sort of fun way of, you know, engaging people of all ages with, um, you know, what, what the potential really is behind these things. Okay. I know I'm going over time. Um, can I show one more project or should I stop? No, of course. course. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know it's hard, it's your Friday night. Um, so I'll, I'll do the, the last sort of category, um, which is shorter anyways. Um, so when, when we think about living together in cities, right, in public space, um, we're sort of departing from the realm of the residential and it becomes more about um, how, how we are together as a society. And this is sort of getting into the work of Ideal X design. Excuse me. And um, this is really um, work that uh, situates itself in the tradition of, you know, work that perhaps started with Archigram in the 60s and 70s. And what you see here is Archigram's Instant City project where a blimp basically comes over a town, right, just any sort of generic town. And, um, and from the blimp sort of brings down all kinds of equipment, et cetera, that catalyzes interaction, uh, catalyzes sort of connection between people. And then eventually as it leaves in images five and six, leaves behind an altered uh, social condition and an altered urban life. And so that is what I would sort of describe is, you know, some of the things um, that uh, we are interested in with, with Ideal X and, um, it perhaps also links to my personal history, which some of you might have heard in my interview with, I think, Stephanie, um, you know, where I talked about sort of going to architecture school in Berlin and finding the city after the wall came down, really coming to life with people just doing stuff and not just architects, not just artists, like everyone, right? And oftentimes things would be, would be, um, uh, 
temporary, very temporary, but ultimately it ended up actually producing, producing new urban code, planning code that um, acknowledged that temporary use can really be a catalyst for long-term transformation. So Berlin as a city was an incredibly exciting um, uh, environment to study architecture in because it immediately sort of broadened my sort of sense of like how people act in the city and then therefore how architects act when they're also dealing with citizens and with temporary um, interventions etc and that this needed to lead to a kind of expansion of the architectural toolkit. So speaking of toolkits, um, I want to show you a project that um, it's, it's again sort of a small lineage of projects um, that we call co-drawing. This specific sub-project was actually called All Covered With, playing on a song, <laughs> song title. Um, but in essence, um, to, it was a critique on traditional citizen engagement. Um, which takes place more often than not through um, sort of relatively formal community meetings in which citizens get to say yes or no to a design proposal by an architect and um, sort of uh, acknowledging that in recent years and perhaps through you know cities like Berlin um, there has been more recognition that citizens in fact hold expertise like their experience of a space the meaning of place for a community the knowledge of changes in that community etc there's lived experience that is uh, really, really useful, right, to bring into design work. So one trajectory for IDLX has been um, looking at drawing as a collective act that brings together and uh, begins to gather citizen knowledge. So this work began with the gallery installation that you see here, which prompts city dwellers to interact with the work, co-drawing visions for and of their city. Um, visitors align, misalign, and draw on paired drawing scrolls, which you see on the right. So there's little wheels, you know, on the left and the right, and there's two separate sort of scrolls that, you know, can kind of be forwarded. And um, we drew um, uh, basically specific, uh, specific conditions in the city. Um, vacant sites, you know, that have sort of latent potential. So we learned a lot in the process of doing this. So here on the left is our very sort of crisp set of um, axonometric drawings, axonometrics again chosen as a drawing type that can be understood by um, by lay people yet is a little bit of a little bit abstract and the two scrolls basically led to fun alignments you know or duplications they were not exactly the same scrolls and you know here's a view again of the suitcase you know that was uh, exhibited in the Milwaukee Art Museum and it was there for a while <laughs> it was there for a month I think and we were not there <laughs> so what happened on the right is uh your proverbial toilet stall wall of commentary where you know little very little um useful information remained um because so many people you know in interacted not just with our drawings but also commented on what other people had commented on and so um it, it certainly taught us that um we need to design not just this kind of artifact, you know, that can travel in a suitcase, you know, but we really also need to design sort of the event or the prompts or, you know, just something that sort of adds additional sort of frameworks and contains what happens in order to get useful information. Um, this uh, suitcase hasn't been with us uh, in three years. It's been in Denver and it's been in Las Vegas, and I believe the pandemic put it in storage, but it's supposed to go to New Orleans next. And every single time it travels, we, we send a new set of scrolls with local drawings and learn about the city and, you know, sort of try to pick up a kind of contemporary issue to gather information on. Um, we also did this with students. Um, this is a, a summer studio we did in Berlin um, and we partnered with a developer there and also with uh, the architects collective uh, Raumlabor and an interdisciplinary group of CCA students um, we brought with us and the purpose here was to make a kickoff, design a kickoff event for the engagement of residents in the transformation of an urban quarter around a huge social housing complex, which you see at the top left. It's this cruciform thing here in the middle. And it's got a park around it and it's very close to Potsdamer Platz, like to the center of the city. And so we, we try to understand what spaces in the local and extended neighborhood hold significance for the community 
and are already used as gathering spaces that would want to be uh, retained or you know at least sort of augmented and in order to do this the students designed a 30 foot long table um, that gave the name uh, to the event called drawing table or Zeichentisch in German and so uh, for 12 hours basically we shared meals and conversation with uh, residents you know passed through that particular part of town um, over the course of a day and um, the table was positioned outside of a storefront of a few of a former um, a supermarket. So you see in the background a second set of drawings um, that was a kind of uh, backdrop for us to curate the information that we were gathering on the table itself. So here's um, some, you know, these were all freehand drawings and these were more perspectival than anything else. And these are the drawings that went into the storefront and they sort of paralleled the sites that um, were shown on the table. So on the table, you know, like the drawing sort of intermingled with the food and with these sort of little menus, you know, that also held the pens and the menus held uh, sort of prompts, you know, for people to think about. And we found, you know, that a lot of people would hesitate, right, um, to draw on this nice paper tablecloth. And so in order to break down the barrier, we added these uh, speech bubbles. Uh, sort of stacks of them so people could also just sort of draw on the little post-it speech bubble and then in the course of the event these speech bubbles could be mounted to the window behind and the students began to sort of uh, use a marker to translate and draw what people thought on the storefront itself and then these drawings were sort of left behind um, after everything was sort of dismounted. So um, here we learned, you know, that um, it was really helpful for us to be there and for a lot of us to be there. And um, we spent basically the day in conversation, sort of breaking down any kind of hesitation that people had in engaging with the question or engaging with us or engaging um, with drawings. So there's one more iteration of this, which we call the continuous campus. Um, this is just, uh, this was just designed by uh, ideal X and this is a set of portable tables that can go anywhere um, with sort of varying um, coverings and this particular uh, version of it was took place at a conference um, for designers and urbanists so here we didn't have a layperson uh, audience so we drew differently and we also learned again like that there has to be more of a prompt that needs to be really designed so what we did here is we brought in these giant dice so these are like two and a half inches in you know in all directions and we produced two different kinds so there was a playful element to all of this um, so I should say that the, the this element was uh, critiquing the campus as um, a kind of traditional typology of you know learning environment and a typology in which the exchange of, of knowledge between disciplines is not exactly easy. Like there's a lot of siloization, right? Of like here's here's the engineering building, here's the architecture building, etc. And no one talks to one another. So critiquing that environment of learning, you know, by sort of calling it the continuous campus and then having one set of dice with um, uh, different sort of unconventional sites on a campus, like a stair, a niche, you know, a plant, um, a hallway, you know, etc. So like weird and unexpected sites. Um, and then because we were dealing with an expert audience, we made another set of dice that uh, basically uh, took reference projects from sort of design and activism. Um, so here you see, I think in the image, um, a project by Future Farmers that's called This Is Not a Trojan Horse. And it's a kind of art installation that gathered knowledge um, between villages uh, in a remote environment. And then we also sort of would describe that like on the respective opposite side of the dice, you know, there, there was a little bit more of an explanation in case people didn't know um, what we were talking about. And then the tables themselves contained planned drawings. Again, expert audience, we could sort of do that. Um, and uh, um, so this was very different. And then we, we also sort of contained the, the, the event to 45 minutes. So it was a very sort of quick thing um, that um, was very successful in um, how people engaged what we were doing. 
Um, and uh, it was really interesting to see the different groups along the table, you know, where some were barely drawing, but really discussing it. And then others were playing with the dice and others were just kind of going about it and drawing. And we were super excited by, you know, the, the kind of suggestions for breaking open the traditional campus that came out of this, albeit a bit messy, you know, but um, this was actually uh, producing a kind of legible um, set of suggestions and annotated suggestions that um, we could use to, to work forward on, on future projects. So super quick, this is just four slides or so. Um, we also do work in activating public space. We did this by um, working with a private client. This is a company called Off the Grid, who does these food truck based events in the same location in public locations. And these always have to, have to sort of come and go, right? It's a parking space or it's a park and it has other uses. So we developed for them um, a project that they could use on empty latent urban sites uh, for a period of, um, uh, that are maybe empty for a period of one or two years. And we call these hubs and huts, and it's a kind of play on a greenhouse structure. You see that on the right, where you can sort of pull away a smaller hut from a bigger hub. And the hub is dimensioned so that food trucks can pull up next to it. And you know, basically, uh, it produces a kind of covered uh, eating space or event space. And you see here sort of um, plan-based studies of like all the different uh, um, configurations that uh, can happen. And the sad part about this project is, you know, we designed this. We did construction documents. Oops, there's a typo. Sorry, in all of this. Um, uh, where we, we detailed it, we worked for a really long time on this and worked on a number of California cities with planning departments. And um, this is a sort of case in point for how um, this way of practicing and designing these kinds of structures is really difficult to execute. And this is because the city has no category to understand this under. The city knows how to give you a permit for a wedding tent, you know, that is gone after a day or for a building, right? And there is no sort of permit structure in place that would allow for understanding a one to two year structure. And therefore we, you know, the, the company off the grid was confronted with all kinds of red tape. And to this day, none of this has actually gotten built, you know, which feels terrible given that we worked on this for like three years um, and, you know, on many, many different sites. Um, but for ourselves, you know, we took that forward. Um, and this is something that specifically seemed relevant to us in our current still uh, ongoing pandemic situation. And we called this continuation of the project, which is again, just research, no client. Um, we called it anything, anytime, anywhere architecture or AAAA. And we basically sort of asked ourselves, um, uh, what is a kind of architecture that is flexible and has a, a long-term yet temporary life? Um, and uh, specifically, um, how can this uh, kind of architecture support uh, all the many sort of things that are now happening in our urban parks, in our parking lots, etc., now that people can't gather indoors because of the pandemic? And um, so basically, uh, this kind of uh, architecture considers the role and the need for mobile structures that are quickly transformed and redeployed to engage new, um, though historically not unique, definitions of publicness. So you might see these as pop-up food shops for FEMA meal distribution, rave stages that become demonstration platforms, hothouse flower production that become medicinal herb sharing, coffee huts that become medicinal testing station ornamental greenhouses um, as a kind of continuation of the city beautiful movement, et cetera, et cetera. And what you see here specifically was part of an Instagram series. I encourage you to look at that, um, which you can find under hashtag urbanism beyond Corona, which was hosted by the Urban Works Agency and has, I think about 124 global uh, contributions to ideas about urbanism after Corona. And then very recently, we uh, were finalists in a competition for a public space in Mexico, um, where we again sort of renamed it and redesigned it a little bit. Um, but basically, the competition asked for exactly that. How do we gather during the pandemic? What are ways in which architecture can facilitate socially distanced public life? And so here, you know, the structure becomes a bit more iconic. 
and then our uh, little use drawings become augmented by a Diego Rivera mural, um, which was drawn on the same plaza for the same plaza that the competition was for. And then we had a lot of fun um, clipping and applying uh, R Rivera's figures, you know, to have our little uh, installation basically drawn by one of his uh, horseback riders and, you know, kind of having people sort of distributing food that actually came from this mural, you know, that was critical sort of and reflective of public life uh, at the time of De Vera, Rivera's production. With that, I thank you very much for um, your long patience um, with me. And I put in a few links in case you want to sort of uh, see more. I can probably copy and paste those into the chat as well uh, by unsharing my screen. And I'm very happy to answer any questions if you still want to spend extra time with me. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I love the passion. It, it, it's beautiful. Oh, good. <laughs> Definitely. And, and, and it, it, I mean, it, it's a good, uh, your passion is a good thing to pass on to the students so that they can see, you know, what you can do with architecture. I hope so, right? I mean, I, I feel like with, with architecture being, on the one hand, subject to the fluctuation of um, the economy and, you know, all kinds of things, right, um, as, as we sort of look at several years' time, and, and a long-term practice, and also with the many sort of new problems that arise in the world, right? I feel strongly that um, like a training as architects um, enables us to uh, really be very useful and very creative vis-a-vis um, -vis a lot of different issues and to leverage the kind of knowledge that we gain, right? Like the way we draw, the way we research, the way we build, Etc. All of that can be applied in a huge amount of uh, areas and, and arenas. Definitely. Um, so at this moment, I'll open the floor to, to questions. If somebody has a question, either type it into the chat or, or be, feel free to, you know, voice it out. Thank you for the nice comment <laughs> in the chat. <laughs> Um, I was wondering how you um, ended up going to school in Berlin or where are you from? How did you end up going there? Oh, God, <laughs> it's the world's most <laughs> unlinear trajectory. <laughs> um, <laughs> I actually started uh, my, my design training at a smaller scale. Um, I studied interior architecture and furniture design which is probably why I still sort of like the installation scale, you know, in, in public space. Um, uh, I, I started out that way, also kind of oscillating between like wanting to become a photographer, you know, and just sort of not really knowing. Um, and then I realized quite quickly that um, interior architecture felt limiting. It felt limiting mostly in the questions that were asked, you know, as part of the training. And, you know, I just sort of noticed I had broader, broader interests. And um, uh, one of the ways for me to bring that out was that that first um, degree um, required you to be out in practice for one year. So you, you did two years in the program, then left for one year and then came back for a year and a half. And um, I had to do an internship and I really wanted to get out of uh, Germany, right? And out of Stuttgart where I'm from originally and uh, basically ended up in the United States through, you know, total accidents, like meeting an architect on an airplane from New York. And, you know, I mean, none of this is like particularly premeditated. <laughs> so um, I, I'm completely humbled by how deliberate a lot of people that I meet, you know, a lot of my students are, you know, and I wish I had been that. And then, so I, I was in San Francisco actually working for um, uh, seven months. And then I did, instead of more internship, I did the other half year um, in a school for industrial design in Paris and, you know, went smaller in scale rather than bigger, right? I worked in an architecture office, but also smaller than that. And um, I think that helped me sort of figure out like where I wanted to be and that I did want to sort of do architecture. And um, 
I am, I think, really fundamentally a city person. I'm excited by density and, you know, by, by cultural life of a city. So I did want to um, study in Berlin, partially for that reason and partially because the wall had come down a few years earlier. And I just knew, you know, what was sort of happening with the city. It was one giant question mark, basically. Like, no one knew, like, who the East German property belonged to. You know, it's like a free-for-all. And um, my education there was very much shaped by that. In three years there, um, I never designed a building. I designed, basically, like, portable portable strategies that I would take to developers to convince them to have temporary events in their empty office buildings. And, you know, I, I never ever did, did a building. And so while I love that, you know, the sort of hybridization of art and architecture and activism, I really uh, got scared. You know, I kind of couldn't envision at the time how I would support myself. And out of that, a friend asked me to join summer school at UC Berkeley. And that in turn sort of uh, led to encouragement by faculty there, you know, for me to, to apply to the master's program, which I did and I got accepted and funded and so on. So again, like never applied to any other graduate school, <laughs> just applied to the one. And um, I'm, I'm so embarrassed in hindsight by, you know, my sort of lack of research, lack of, um, you know, just just kind of uh, broader, broader uh, vision. And uh, I, I would say as the last answer to your question, um, th this John K. Brenner Fellowship that Berkeley offers, um, I was really fortunate to get that. Um, but that basically pushed me even further towards an urban um, trajectory uh, because I got to travel for one year um, alone and uh, got basically got to follow my, my passion, you know, my thesis project. And um, I traveled uh, mostly to cities of either uh, political conflict or really fast growth and uh, looked at how they had transformed by, from the bottom up in order to sort of see like, well, where is the room for architecture, right? And is there room for architecture in these sort of, you know, migration processes, et cetera. So that's, that's what I have to say. Um, Thank you. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Oh, I have a question here from uh, Victoria it says, when you design for urban, urban planning, what has been one principle that has been consistent throughout the process? What do you recommend sticking to? What goal do you recommend we focus on? Wow, such a good question. Um, th this is really fabulous. Um, I would probably want to wiggle my way out a little bit <laughs> by saying like, I don't do urban planning. Um, so urban planning is, is sort of your, um, or at least the, the term is, is typically uh, used for the kind of master planning, you know, where we as architects or urban designers kind of make the big drawings for entire parts of the city. And I would actually sort of say like, I'm, I'm really trying to not do that. And uh, that also, I think, is an answer to your question, right? What is consistent throughout the process and throughout perhaps like my many sort of scales at which I have worked, um, which is a sort of belief in um, the fact that architects are not, um, are not, uh, you know, sort of all knowing and, you know, brilliant and, you know, um, can just impose their vision on people. And uh, instead, I think, you know, I'm, I'm definitely sort of shaped by the excitement of what it means to work more collaboratively and really learn from, you know, people, right? <laughs> and and from, from the communities in the city. And, you know, um, so I don't know if that answers or is that, if that's exactly the kind of consistency you were looking for, but I think that the broader answer to it is probably um, what I recommend is that you become clear with yourself, right? Like what is behind your own interests? And that can be hard, I would say, in the first two years of architecture training, you know, where oftentimes like your interests are simply shaped by what assignment you get in a studio class, right? But what I would say is that each of you, like when you, when you work on an assignment, automatically bring to that assignment interests that you inherently have. 
right? You focus on something, you know, your, your work brings out certain aspects of architecture, whether it's interactions with the environment or it's an awareness of, you know, what goes on in the urban context, or, you know, it's something about construction techniques. It can be any number of things, but um, it's really helpful. And I find that um, like anytime you have to put together a portfolio or like I had today with a lecture, anytime I give a lecture, I get to reflect on that again, right? Looking back on like, here's all this work that I've done where is that sort of thread that leads through it, right? Where, where is sort of the thing that I am passionate about? So my recommendation, I think, to all of you is really um, to, to kind of interrogate the things you've already done, right? And to sort of look at like, why did I do this? Why did I gravitate, gravitate towards this? Or what was I most excited about? And um, to find ways in which you can keep that present in your career. And, you know, it, it'll be funny in, in hindsight, right, like that oftentimes things feel so like different, but then it, it's also actually easy to, to pull the thread out and sort of see like, oh, yeah, I'm actually still exactly the same person I was in like 1995. <laughs> so that's my long, long answer, but feel free to follow up if I didn't uh, exactly uh, address what you meant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any, anybody else want to? Jump in with a question. I, I have I have questions, Prof, but I would love to hear from from the students if there's any. Uh, well, it doesn't seem like anybody's jumping in, so go ahead. Okay. Oh man, so many questions. Well, hi, first of all, hi Angie. Uh, hi. I'm so, uh, <laughs> I'm so uh, <laughs> great to see you too. I'm so happy to to welcome you and have you here in El Paso, <laughs> even if it's virtually. Um, I, I, I never really had the pleasure of uh, having a, a class with you, really. Um, it was all just uh, some, you know, critique interaction or, you know, yeah, just uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the lifestyle, CCA lifestyle. But I'm so happy that you're here um, sharing with us your, your work um, and, and hear it from you because I, I really was not uh, submerged, you know, into the different aspects of it. Um, you know, just as a side note, I, I am very familiar with the urban living kind of thing. I, I spent many times crashing at a friend's couch. Uh, he, he lived in, I don't know if you're familiar, it's called Urban, it was called back then Urban Art Farm or something like that. Urban, it, it's a few blocks from CCA oh on 17th yeah. Street. Yeah. <laughs> I, have you, are you familiar with that? I am familiar with it. Yeah. You are familiar with them? Uh, and so see it right now that it's actually a, something that someone has taken the time to study, document, and present to the world is like kind of unreal in a way. <laughs> so, so thank you for doing that. Yeah, I'm glad you got um, to mention something like that. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I, I, I did not have the pleasure of living there, but I did have the pleasure of spending an, a lot of time there. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, from, from spending nights there to actually even doing laundry there. So I, I wouldn't have to pay somewhere else. They would lend me their, their, their laundry machines. Um, uh, many parties there as well. I don't know. It, it's a whole thing that I, I really, I, I think people need to like, kind of like live it, kind of like understand it. But, but anyway, um, I guess my, my question to you is um, uh, I, right now, uh, during COVID and post-COVID, you know, um, what, what is your, I guess, what are you excited about, right? Or what are you curious about, you know, in terms of this living situation, particularly in places of high density? And, yeah. um, you know, how has the situation, current situation, maybe, I don't know, it, it, I, I, I haven't really heard, but has this affected the density right now? As, is there people moving out? Are, are rent prices going down? So I, I guess that's, that's one of my questions, you know, I mean, what, what are you looking forward after this uh, phase or, or period in urban living, dense, high density urban living? Wow, oh, it's a big question. Um, so I'll, oh. I'll answer some of the sub questions first um, by, by sort of saying um, the, uh, the co-living sort of uh, scene has definitely been affected by the pandemic. Um, enough of the places that I know of and know people at um, have survived. But for example, the bad Victorian that I showed you all um, is no longer in action. And, you know, that, that is perhaps because um, in the end, there were a lot of people living there. You know, it's a big, big, big community. 
um, and uh, many of them might have been um, you know, scared by, you know, living in the presence of other people. I think in other instances, it's really actually been a saving grace to live with your chosen family and have a sort of pod, right, that you can be safe within, you know, where everyone takes responsibility for one another. Um, so uh, I, I am, first of all, curious um, what the longer term effect is on the co-living scene. I do not think at all that it, it's going to go away, right, because it's, again, it's driven by more than one factor. It, it might have some economic uh, reasons behind it, but it really is the main reason, I think, is our need for uh, different kinds of social interactions, right, and different forms of social units. You know, people marry later, have children later, you know, there's just different ways in which we live in cities. So I'm, I'm simply sort of curious whether perhaps as more projects get designed um, for collective living, right, as our work with the planning department um, hopefully bears fruit at some point, right, and there's real leg legislation for projects like this. I wonder how it affects like that legislation and how it affects how architects respond. Like, are we now all somehow more protective of our private sphere, even within collective living, because of the influence of the pandemic? And I'm sure, you know, the pandemic has affected all of us, but in different ways. So um, I find that very, very uh, difficult to predict, right? Like how exactly we're going to um, act. So that, that's, I think, the sort of answering your question with regard to living, right? And, and sort of the, the communal living um, aspect of my work. Um, I uh, have to say, you know, like without sounding too pessimistic, but I, I think um, given how the vaccine rollout um, has been happening across the globe, I'm not super confident that um, we'll be totally back to normal anytime soon. There's also so many uh, vaccine skeptics um, across the world and specifically in the US. So I do think that public life and, you know, collective life in the city will probably be continue to be very affected by this. And so that that's why I sort of ended on this this project with the mobile structures anywhere architectures. Because to some degree, I think that is kind of what we need, right? That is sort of the way in which, like one of the things that I didn't necessarily talk about was um, that these these little structures become mobile classrooms, right? And I, I you know, as a, as a German, you know, still, um, I, I hear so many different scenarios of how schools are trying to reopen. And then of course, as a chair at CCA, <laughs> I get to sort of figure out solutions in which we can return to the building. And um, I think there is uh, there, there is such difficulty in, in keeping up with health regulations within buildings. So what I'm excited about is really like the way in which we've moved more activities out into the city that used to be in interior sort of like guarded, if not like with a pay threshold uh, spaces. And they now happen outside. We can see each other, right? We can see different activities out in the public sphere. And um, I'm, I'm sort of, I think there is a sort of challenge for all of us to think about how architecture helps facilitate the kind of coexistence of these different activities in out in public, right? In outdoor space, in outdoor environments. All right. Well, thank you, Antia. <laughs> My pleasure. Well, no other questions popped up, so uh, we'll go ahead and help. Oh, do you have more? Maybe, maybe, yeah, just one more. Since we have her, since we have her right here, you know, and I, I, I would really like to to hear from Angie because when you know, I mean, seeing your presentation and and listening to your presentation, you know, I mean, and uh, you know, having lived in San Francisco and you know, I mean, coming back back to El Paso uh, and the border, um, you know, what I guess. What would be your message to to maybe a place locally? I, I don't know if we have an issue of of uh, of space. You know, what I mean, for us here, you know, we're either kind of blessed or maybe it's a blessing, the curse. You know, what I mean, they're sprawling for sure, right? I mean, but but uh, I think here we're very used and accustomed to a front yard, a patio. You know, what I mean, the, at the, you know, at the space and having a lot of it. Would you have a message maybe for maybe tr going into the future, right? I mean, what, what to do with that or, or what to, I don't know. I mean, 
So, so there's places that right now are struggling with density and struggling with space. I mean, should we keep sprawling where we can? Is that a solution? Should we, you know, I mean, what, what the, how, do, how does someone that doesn't have that issue and really doesn't really know what you're talking about? Like, well, what do you, why would people want to be living like that, right? I mean, what, what message would you have to that so that maybe we either don't get there or that when we get there are prepared? I'm just curious about that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> also, a very difficult question. Um, I, um, I know that um, many people growing up in U.S. cities right, are not used to the kind of density that maybe I grew up with in, in your Central European cities, and um, that that has produced another lifestyle, right? That that has valuable aspects, and that um, you know people don't necessarily question. But I actually, I, I would probably say, as architects, we have to, right? And I say this because. Um, the, the kind of the way of building suburbs traditionally, right, and the sort of sprawling and eating up of uh, land um, is something that certainly has contrib contributed in major ways to climate change. Um, and it's really worth um, looking at, I think I would actually say it's, it's not just worth, it's our responsibility as architects, right, as people working in architecture and related disciplines um, to look at where we do have impact, right, or have had impact as a discipline on climate change and on sort of um, the kind of social issues and economic inequality that we do see in cities. And that might lead all of us to critically examine like the, the way we grew up, right, the fabric of architecture and housing that we grew up in. So um, I'm, I'm going to put that out there, right? This and put that responsibility onto all of us. Um, I didn't grow up in the center of Stuttgart, for example, and I'm hugely critical of, you know, in retrospect of the the kind of periphery of Stuttgart and how people sort of live there, um, you know, for for many many reasons. So I'm not speaking from any kind of pedestal of like knowing better and having done it better necessarily, um, and um, and then. Otherwise, I think um, there, there's sort of another layer to your question that I think for me brings back just the, the reflections on community, right, and how we, um, how we build community and, you know, how we build sort of communal culture and public life. And I would say that that has a very different form, right, in, in every single location, right? And it depends partially on the, the, the physical, spatial environment. It also really does depend on kind of local cultures, right, and, and uh, histories. Um, and so uh, I, I think the lessons perhaps um, of that, that, that can be drawn, you know, from the more sort of dense work that, that I presented is um, to look in your own contexts um, to uh, where social interaction and public life really happens, right? And to look closely and again, look for the opportunities um, wh where sort of architecture or you as an architect, as sort of moderator, activist, intermediary, etc., cetera, um, might sort of further the development of that community. And it would look differently, right? It's not, there, there's no point in me saying like, let's go and like have everyone live in groups of 25 in El Paso, not the point, right? But um, it would probably be really interesting for me, for sure, not knowing a lot about El Paso. I have been, <laughs> but <laughs> it's been a long time. Um, but I, I would be really curious to sort of um, learn more about sort of family types, right? And how people sort of move out of their own family, to you know perhaps sort of like where you live during college you know to where you live as a young professional etc and to study the trends you know of that and then sort of reflect back on uh, what is the sort of environment that El Paso offers and do we need other typologies right that that really cater to the social units that are needed and they may not be the same social units that you know San Francisco needs or has yeah, yeah, that, that that would be very, very interesting, you know, I mean, and, and especially when do, I think you're talking about when do um, a, a kids or, you know, the, the kids move out of the house or, yeah. and, and what do they move into, right, and, and when that happens, yeah. I, I think yeah. that's. Where are the friction points, right, in, in all of that, like, where is the sort of moments that are uncomfortable or 
it's hard to find housing or, you know, like I think every city has that in some form. Um, and it's a matter of like how you, like that's where research comes in, right? To, to sort of um, try to understand like in detail what the situation is and then find your place within it. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Thank you for the great questions. And of I course. also want to give a quick shout out to Luis, who recently graduated from CCA. So great to see you, Luis. Congratulations. Um, I also have a question. Yes. <laughs> okay. So how do we use, um, by, well, by the way, thank you for the presentation. Um, I thought it was really nice. Thank you. Um, how do we use the, the type of research that we get from social issues to actually do something about it instead of just making it just like a research paper? Yeah, yeah. Also really good question. Um, I find, you know, as a person who teaches a lot of housing studios, um, I am sort of the queen of introducing, getting to be the first one to introduce like social issues. <laughs> and um, what I notice often is I look back at the studio or two before mine, and I'm amazed at like how inventive people are in their form making and like doing super interesting buildings and, um, you know, just incredible stuff. And then I, I have people do research, right? Like the, the research you just mentioned um, of like, uh, what about a certain population group? You know, what are their needs? Um, you know, what is going on with the trends? And suddenly it seems like all the kind of knowledge of being a designer, making form, making spatial relationships goes out the window, right? It's a very, very difficult thing to bring back together. And um, all I, I don't have necessarily like the total recipe, <laughs> you know, to, to do this, but I would perhaps point back to um, the commoning domestic space sort of research, you know, where, yes, we are trying to learn about, you know, how people share space and how they, you know, how they govern their 20 person household, right, and how, how they sort of uh, sort out all the difficulties. But we never look at that without automatically looking at, okay, where is this, you know, like, what's the architecture like, what are the boundary conditions like, what's the footprint like, what is it quantitatively, what is it qualitatively, so and all of that social stuff cannot, if you want to learn from it as an architect, right, it, it has to somehow remain connected to the space it happens within. And when, when I argue that, right, I, I don't necessarily say that the connection is always super direct, right? I wish it was, um, but uh, I think it has us think hard about um, how architecture shapes use or shapes behavior or consciously allows for misuse, you know, through ambiguity that we design into it. But I think this is all we can really do, right, in order to, um, you know, really connect our, our physical work to the societies and communities we work inside of is to understand literally those relationships between use, between people and the physical structure. Right and like where where architecture like I, um, we all have that tendency to say like oh and I, I designed this so it makes people do that and we all know that that is not the case right like architecture does not make people do anything but architecture is a framework right that that sort of sets a platform in which things can happen and um, I I personally sort of credit perhaps that year of traveling on my own and just basically like watching <laughs> for 12 months right of like looking at people okay. in the built environment and trying to sort of figure out like why are they doing this or why have they changed the built environment right um specifically as as sort of populations shifted etc and literally trying what you're asking right trying to make that relationship of seeing like okay johannesburg is a divided city and entire the entire downtown has been emptied out and converted to housing and a lot of stuff has happened why exactly and how exactly right and how does that sort of manifest itself in the way that people have changed their own environment so looking for that i think is my my answer like how how we learn that i think it's observation really okay yeah i do i do feel like it's a difficult task 
trying to do it, especially if you're not with a a huge team of people that are all like on the same goal. But I do think um, like hopefully I can get to that point where I can actually do something about it, you know? Yeah, yeah. If you pay attention, right? And it seems like you really are. I have no doubt that you can. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, one, one more question or no? Anybody? Okay. It looks like uh, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful lecture. Uh, Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it was just you know, spectacular.